Doubles out, and I'm telling you, the men's doubles is unbelievable. You're just watching, and it's like, oh my gosh. For the final last year, the I think it was the, I won't say which final it was, we had a final being played, and there was a match on Ash, and people came out because the match was really quick, and they started watching our match, and they're like, wow, this is better than what was in there. I'm just saying that to the 30 people that are sitting here. So it's really fun when you get to watch. The players want to be known as athletes. They are athletes. They don't want the play they don't want us to feel sorry for them or to treat them any differently. They train as hard, if not harder, than any of the able bodied athletes. That's the other myth. We don't want to go coddle the players and the athletes when they're playing. We treat them just like we would treat anything else. So those are my two myths right there. I'm gonna push you over to the guy that knows more than anybody in the whole, I would say, world, maybe about wheelchair tennis. He is Jason Harnett. He's our national coach and national um, manager, Paralympic coach, been around for 20 years. Um, and I just can't say enough about him and the knowledge that you're gonna gain from him today. Oh, I hope so. Hope so. Yeah, you guys over there, mind coming down? I think it's such a small group. It just might be better. We're all on one, one half of the court. So thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. How many of you guys, how many of you guys know about which? I know you're interested now. Really, hey, I know wheelchair things I've heard. Okay, some of you guys. Any of you guys who've seen it, not just heard about it, but actually seen it? And how many of you guys have actually jumped in a chair and played? Okay, so for some of you today, that might be a wonderful opportunity. We did bring out uh, some chairs uh, for you guys all to try. That makes all the difference in the world. We always say, you know, you hear about it, you see it, you maybe get on the court, hit with someone in a chair as an able-bodied person, um, and then you finally get in the chair, and it really does change your perspective. It changes uh, really your appreciation for the athlete himself, because it is so difficult. So I think we'll get a, a chance to get some of you guys out here today. Just a quick historical background, because I think it's important, you know, this side of the, the sport, um, it's kind of it's flown under the radar, but we're not new. I think that's really important we find out all the time, everyone's interested in what we're doing, uh, what's going on in the world of wheelchair tennis. And you remind them, going, hey, wheelchair tennis has been around 40, 42 years. Okay, we're in the 42nd year. Back in 1976, Brad Parks, you probably heard that name before. Uh, you know, Brad's been around a long time. Uh, he's gonna be hopefully engaging us in Lake Nona later this year. Um, but again, 42 years of wheelchair tennis. It's in all, all four Grand Slam events. You've got the Paralympic Games, you've got a singles masters, you've got a doubles masters. It's the most professionalized sport, easily, of all the disabled sports. You've probably all heard of wheelchair basketball, uh, you know, track and field, uh, the road racers at the, the Boston Marathon. You see all that. The tennis has its own organized tour. It's managed by the ITF. Uh, there's talk of sharing uh, potential space at the masters events on the ATP and WTA tours, uh, potentially bringing in wheelchair tennis to that. So as you can see professionally, it's growing. And I think what's important is when we came in, I mean, I've been around a long time. I started, it really started in 1996, is when I got engaged uh, in wheelchair tennis and saw it as a kid. Um, having seen every step of the way at the USTA uh, and, and stuff that's been done with the USPTA, uh, you know, we, we had to take a strong look at our pathway. You know, is it clean? Where are the gaps in this pathway? Where, where are the stop gaps that really stop growth? Our focus has become more grassroots. Uh, but we have so many, with the national campus in Orlando, we now have the first, for the first time, an opportunity to really engage and collaborate with the departments that we haven't, and we've needed to for 20 years. The USTA became our national governing body for wheelchair tennis and Paralympic tennis in 1998, okay, it's 2018. It's a long time we've been waiting for this opportunity. So we're, we're seizing it, okay? So now we're engaged with just about every department. A couple major hits for us. Net generation we see as a massive uh, ability for us to engage at the grassroots level. We've always had the idea of going into uh, you know, rehab hospitals. That's not a new idea. But we now, for the first time, have an ability to go into a rehab hospital with branding, with a professional backing, with product that we can come in, and now a curricula that we can bring in 
and teach physical therapists, occupational therapists, recreational therapists on the ground. And those are the kids that are getting the first touch with sport in their rehab process. And the monster for us has been wheelchair basketball. It's been a huge killer for us as far as taking our numbers. So we see that opportunity as being, as being massive for us. So when you look down the bloodline, collegiate tennis is also another big miss. It does exist, uh, but it needs far more support. So we've decided to take a, a real focus on six to 10 schools and trying to create scholarship opportunities. As we see 12 to 20, it sounds like such a low number, but 12 to 20 scholarships versus 80 to 100 in wheelchair basketball. So if I'm a parent of a kid in a chair, you know, where am I looking for collegiate help financially? I'm going to basketball. And so we need to do a better job at the entry point and trying to touch those kids first, or at least alongside, give those parents and kids an option. So that's another, another miss that, we, that we're trying to remedy. The biggest thing of all, we feel, at least on the professional side, is our engagement, new engagement with player development. When we first came here, we weren't engaged in player development at all. We were only engaged in community tennis. And so now we're being embraced by player development with the leadership of Martin Blackman and Paul Lovers uh, and Larry Lauer you know, and Kent, who's here. I mean, everyone, we're taking a really strong look at how we can engage on that side because we really have never done that. And now for the first time, we have uh, a full-time Paralympic athlete training in Lake Nona with me alongside Mackie McDonald, who you saw, and Caroline and Jenny, and, and working with Steven directly, working with Jose Caballero directly. These are all monumental moments in wheelchair tennis. You know, these are kind of dream things we've had for a very long time. So for us to come in and really within 18 months make those sort of changes, it's, been a, it's really been a heavy lift, uh, and it will continue. Okay, but we also knew coming in here, engaging coaches was going to be for me, it's been that way for 20 years. A primary focus should be getting folks like yourselves, bringing programming into your clubs. Uh, you start an hour-long wheelchair clinic at your club, you will have 10 to 15 people within a few months there once the word is out. And we can help you guys in, in you know, acquiring chairs like these, because as we'll talk about in a little bit, these chairs really are the first touch with the Athens. For someone to be in an everyday chair, which you've all seen folks use to try to play tennis in them, it's brutal. It's a very negative experience, unpleasant. This chair is very much designed athletically to help them have a great experience, to feel, to feel the mobility, to feel athletic. And so getting you guys chairs like this really is a priority. So some of our grassroots grants could be applied uh, for purchasing chairs if you're interested, so we can talk about that stuff. But so, and that runs, so again, going back to our pathway, we're looking from grassroots, net generation starting point, all the way through Grand Slams and the Paralympic Games, or the Pan American Games, the International World Team Cup, which is our Davis Cup, Fed Cup equivalent. And that's been around since 1985. Okay, so, and some of these things you guys have probably never heard of, of course, the Paralympic Games, uh, the Grand Slams, of course, uh, but the Uniqlo uh, clothing company has sponsored the entire wheelchair tour. There are two athletes on the tour sponsored alongside Kei Nishikori, uh, was Novak Djokovic, now Roger Federer. It's kind of a nice little swap, you know, Novak for Roger. Uh, but to see two of our wheelchair athletes, not U.S., but wheelchair athletes on the professional tour uh, be engaged with that company, who is this tour sponsor, is, is fantastic. Okay, so you can see corporates, corporate sponsors are starting to make their way into wheelchair tennis more and more. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a lay of the land, what the last 40 years has been. 20, you know, 20 plus years ago, Brad Parks and Wendy Parks started something called the National Foundation for Wheelchair Tennis. That was truly the first governing body. But by 98, they had outgrown what they could handle managerially, and that's where the ITF and the USTA came in and helped out. Uh, but I don't think the USTA knew what they were getting into, and I don't think they had a vision of what it needed to look like. And it has taken a long time. Uh, but we do have, again, USTA tournaments and ITF, again, tour the professional events here in the United States. Uh, chair players have the ability to jump into any USTA league or USTA uh, individual tournament. There's nothing stopping them. We've made a conversion in NTRP 
to make that entry point more palatable for the athletes. So we're trying to take a look at, and again, this is also very important. We're not in chairs. I mean, I'm sitting down in a chair right now to demonstrate, but I'm hyper aware that I'm an able-bodied guy kind of leading wheelchair tennis. Seems bizarre. And we've gotten a little bit of feedback on that. Not always positive, not negative, but there's an awareness of why isn't there someone in a chair in this position? And we're working on getting more former players, coaches more qualified to come in and maybe do something like that. I almost see myself as a transition person. The next person in this position will definitely be in the chair. And I think that's appropriate. Okay, they need to take ownership of their sport. But that's where we come in as able-bodied coaches. Very important that we have more engagement. Because without the able-bodied coach, this sport sinks big time. Okay, so it's just a matter of starting a local program. Okay, uh, so I mean that gives you a little gamut of 40 years of where we are now. Uh, now I think we started with Started in the United States with Brad, and now I think we have over, over 80 tournaments, you know, professional tournaments worldwide, and I think 120 countries. So for Brad to look at where it is now, I know, I, I, I'm fortunate to know Brad very well, and we talked about it, we've seen the growth just in the last 20 years. So again, keeping the engagement with you all is really gonna be critical for us. Really important, okay? Um, so I think the next part is to talk to you guys about what you're up against. You know, if you start a program, what's coming your way, okay? You're gonna see disabilities coming your way that maybe you, you didn't even believe was possible. And the biggest hurdle, as Joe said, to overcome is everything's possible. Everything's adaptable. You know, we're all coaches here. We're all creative. You've all had kids that are better than others. You've had to adapt drills to, to make it fit for everyone. It's the exact same thing you'd have to do here, okay? And, and it's just about being creative. Fortunately, we do have some resources to help. And finishing up uh, basically the second edition of our USTA wheelchair manual, that will be very, very helpful to you all. Uh, a lot of drills, a lot of explanations, talking about disability. But these are things that you guys are gonna need to know so you're not scared away. Because coaches that I talk to, they say disability scares, scares me to death, and I don't understand this thing at all. So I don't even know where to begin. So hopefully I can give you a few tips today Keep the focus narrowed to where you can take something away and go, you know what, that wasn't so scary. That's maybe something I can take home and start. Okay, because to me, I had a choice 22 years ago to make a split. I worked in Southern California, very high performance driven area. I worked with Steve Johnson, worked with Ranch Brown, worked with Hank, Hank Lloyd, a lot of really good coaches. And they're like, you gotta come over to this side. And I made a decision. I had already been entrenched since 98. And I said, you know what, I'm sticking with wheelchair because it's got a lot of growth potential and it needs representation. The athletes work too hard, they work as hard as anybody else. They're just people who play in wheelchairs. It's, play, it's tennis in a wheelchair. It's really no big deal, okay? So some of the disabilities I think you'll come across that are common, I mean, paraplegia is very, very common. Someone with a spinal cord injury. But you're gonna come across folks who maybe have a congenital issue who come walking through your door who can't maybe run to a ball, maybe have a, a great deal of pain. You're gonna have to deal with that person and helping them find a chair. You're gonna deal with quadriplegics, cervical level injuries, who, who are relatively high functioning but have upper extremity deficit. Okay, and that's where the creativity and the adaptations come. Whereas if you have someone come to your door in a power chair, right, and they have 30% hand function, and you're trying to figure out how they're gonna grab the racket, you get creative, you use ACE bandages, you use pre-wrap for the, for the kids. You use any method that you can think of that's gonna make it comfortable for the, for the person to play, to get started. That's our job, is to make that first experience a positive one. Okay, and that, those are adaptations that you can make. Um, amputees, you know, we on the high performance side, you know, we look at disability very closely, as we look at upside. If I have a very high level paraplegic player, unfortunately, on the professional tour now, the way it is, that person's upside, so to speak, is gonna be limited because of function. Function drives wheelchair tennis. I mean, for me to play on the professional able body tour at five foot five and three quarters, five six with shoes, would be a problem. It's a problem, right? And so if I'm a high level paraplegic playing against an amputee, that's a problem, right? So, and that's the way the tour is structured right now. There is discussion about classification and so forth that's 
quite complicated that we don't need to get in here today. Um, but we're trying to, again, make it so you guys are familiar with who's coming through your door. So amputees, paraplegics, quadriplegics, again, uh, congenital disabilities that you're going to have to deal with. And it's not dealing with isn't the right word. It's looking at that person. And we talk about getting to know your athlete, talking to them directly about their disability, what they can and cannot do, and trying to push them to do things they didn't think they could do. Those are the critical measures, I think, of a good coach. Right? You're trying to push them to do things they never believed they could do. A lot of folks in chairs never even knew wheelchair tennis existed. They say, well, how do you play tennis in a wheelchair? To go back to the original story with Brad Parks and Jeff Minnebreaker, they're in rehab as 19-year-old kids, and there's a park across the street with a tennis court. And they decide in their old clunky hospital chairs to go across the way, and there's two courts there, and they start to, with the old wood rackets, and they're just bumping the ball around, having a hard time pushing their chair, bumping the ball, and the two, two able-bodied guys next to them ask them why they even bother. Why do you guys even bother coming out here? And Brad being a competitive skier is like, we'll be back here every single day, every day. And within like two or three months, they had improved so much that the two guys asked them to play doubles with them. And that's where it began. So that's why I think it's important when people come to your clubs, and they talk to you, and you're coming with open arms. A lot of compassion, uh, but also a lot of grit and learning how to you know, push them in ways that they haven't been pushed before. Okay? I can keep going, but I'm gonna slow down. And we're gonna talk, talk about the chair, because the chair is a big deal. This is the scary part, right? So I'm gonna pop out and just kind of break down the chair a little bit so I don't trip getting out of this thing. <laughs> Traffic. Okay. So this chair here costs about $2,000, okay, to give you a price point perspective. This chair, some of you guys may not be able to see it, has the ability to be adjusted, okay? That is a unique chair. Most chair manufacturers do that. The reason they do that is because, again, like I said, you have amputees, paraplegics, quadriplegics. You want to have a chair that you might be able to adjust and adapt to that person's disability. Okay, that's really important. Again, it's like having the wrong pair of shoes on. Okay, it's just not comfortable. It may give you an idea, but it's not right. So you want to have chairs that can be adaptable to the athletes. At the elite level, they'll have what we call a fixed chair, meaning the chair has been measured specifically for that person. Like the young lady, Mackenzie Solden, who trains at the national campus, she just received a chair uh, from Invicare. It's probably a four to $5,000 chair. But that chair is it's like a very high-end road racing bike that's been custom cut fitted with no adjustability whatsoever. And the reason is that at the highest level, you want a chair with very little flex. You want it to be stiff, so it's very responsive. And you guys can see in this chair, as I turn it so you guys can see it, the chairs slope inward, right? That's called camber. Most chairs uh, for entry level players is around 18 degrees of camber, right? It's a slight, slight bend. This chair is 20 degrees. This is a little bit more the norm, I would say. I've seen as extreme as 22 degrees. Okay? That chair is extremely agile, but the more you go this way, the slower you push, the more friction on the tires going forward. So 20, 18 to 20 is about right. So that's what you're gonna see. These wheels are 26 inches in diameter. Okay? That's pretty much the standard as well. Some athletes, bigger, stronger athletes, go to 27 inches. Smaller people would probably play 24, 25 inches, okay? And as far as setting it up is concerned, what we try and do is get the balance of the chair right. If I see this backrest is very low, you probably wouldn't put a quadriplegic player in it because of their lack of balance, lack of core stability. This would probably be a chair for an amputee or a very low level paraplegic player, if that makes sense, okay? Strapping, of course, is there to help you guys stabilize the athlete. When I'm in a chair, I want to be as stable and as snug as possible so I can maximize, again, the athletic ability of the chair. So all the straps, backrest, all this stuff is designed to make the chair fit the athlete perfectly. Again, just like a road racing bike would fit uh, a cyclist, like that guy, like that. So, uh, so the chair is, is critical. So I think the next step is going to be trying to get some of you guys out here with me to 
try the chairs. The chairs we have across the way, depends where you work. If you're part of like a rec center, we have basketball courts. The chairs that we have out here, I think all of them except for one, are all sport. It's kind of a hybrid between a basketball chair and a tennis chair. The chair I'm in is specifically for tennis. And there are some differences. Thank you, Joe. If you notice on the front of this chair, you have that bar in front to protect, basically protect the feet, the shins. Uh, this is designed for basketball. In the back, you can also see the tip bar ends at the end of the wheels. That's a basketball regulation. That has to happen. Tennis is, can, of course, stay this way. If you look at my chair, my tip bar goes out beyond the end of the wheels. That would be illegal in basketball. Because as I'm going up, say, for a rebound, and I grab the ball and I turn, that tip bar is going to swipe these chairs, break a spoke, break something. So that's why the limitations. But this chair is totally acceptable for tennis. Uh, so when you start, if you're considering starting a program, these chairs are not a bad alternative if basketball is an option at your club. Not a bad way to get two sports into one, even though we only want tennis players. Um, so, I need some volunteers. I think we have uh, eight chairs. Nine. Nine chairs. Nine. And you need a racket. If you have a racket, if you don't, we'll make do. But if you do, bring it. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. That's okay. So, we need a few more folks. I saw more hands. Come on up. Come on up. There's a whole next step. Pushing with the racket. Maybe just grab the one that fits you. Thank you. I have a racket. Someone to try. <laughs> yep. It's okay. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. We're not gonna be uh, we're not gonna be flying around. I'll give you this one. You know what? Yeah. I'm yeah. Another racket? Hey, get those feet up. Get those feet up. There we go. Cheating already. <laughs> You know what, those, you know, I wouldn't worry so much about the lower strap, just get them out of the way. I wouldn't worry about getting totally dialed into these things. You put the racket in your hand, and the forehand grip. Push. We're talking about that. Chairs aren't in the best shape, but they'll work. <laughs> so these guys are going to demonstrate for everyone how it's done. Or how it's not done. Exactly. Warm up. No, you don't need it. You don't need it. You're not going to, you won't want to have it, I promise. Put me on. So. I, can I just stop real quick? Yeah, please, Joe. Another myth, okay? And I, this is like a big one. Any tennis court is acceptable for wheelchairs to be on. It does not mark the tennis court. And I had this happen this morning. We may have been driving somewhere and they wanted to put padding on the court. I about, like, fell out of the bus. We play on the Grand Slam courts. We play at the Wimbledon, we play at the French, and we play on Ash. It does not mark the courts. So that's another myth that just needs to be busted. The other part, I ran a club in Lexington, and we were not ADA compliant, I'm just being straight up, because we were built like 35, 40 years ago. Players could go in underneath, but not up top. So if you've got a facility, you have to, if you touch the front of your entrance, then you have to become compliant. Make sense? So if we touch any part of that, then we would have to be compliant, but we were grandfathered in before. So we did have accessibility to the court, but we couldn't have players come upstairs. Those are just a few of the technical things, but if anyone, we tell our players too, we've actually had players say we are not, that the tournament director would not let them in a tournament. And I've told them to call me straight away because they're scared of marking the courts. Yeah. Just crazy, ridiculous. How, how many of you guys have clay courts? Clay courts? A lot of you guys. So the only suggestion I would have is the only time I've seen a chair like this damage a court, not never, ever irreparable. Okay? 
okay? But what's gonna need a little more maintenance is a soggy, wet clay court. Not that you let people play on that anyway, but it's really these small wheels in front. I think everybody sees the larger wheels, and they think, you know, when a player comes around, it's gonna rip into the clay. It's really not that, it's that guy in the back. Because as their weight shifts, all their weight's on that wheel, it digs into the clay. Now, if it's a, a, a well-packed, fairly dry clay court, no problem. So that's just important. If you got someone in the chair say, hey, I want to play on your clay court, you should say yes. But go out there with them and say, if it's too wet, you can make that call. We're not interested in getting that reputation. Here they come. The wheelchair athletes are coming, they're going to rip up your courts. It's not the case. Okay? So, question. Yeah. yeah. Great question. question. So the question was, do you have adapted tennis courts uh, specifically for, say, young children uh, or special equipment? We get that a lot. Is the equipment, the only equipment that's really adapted is the chair. All the, 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 the kids' rackets that we use uh, are all easily adapted. You know, the smaller courts we're all using now, the net generation, that's all been adapted. Okay, so that, that's the key is, again, we've been running parallel for so long Okay, we really need to, we, we've needed to integrate for a long time. And so much of the sport is so easily integrated. So equipment being one. The only adapted rule is two bounces. If you guys didn't know that, probably should have said that at the beginning. If you need a second bounce, you're allowed to take it. But you don't have to. That's it. Rackets are the same, balls are the same, dimensions of the court are the same. Let me put in here. What you said about um, the adaptive is really important to you because with net generation stuff out there as well, we've gone through and we've adapted the whole curriculum, okay? And even, you know, you go back to 10 and under tennis, what, 12 years ago, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, this is, the, this is horrible, and getting into it. It's kind of where we are with wheelchairs. We've had players literally say to us, you've got to be in lines, you've got to hand toss the balls, and we've said, no, you don't. And we've actually now been to camps, and we actually had a junior camp and we had one of our players go, and she took the court with the younger kids, and she literally said they could not catch a ball at the beginning of the week. At the end of the week, they were rallying. So again, it's just adapting the curriculum. All that curriculum, just so you know, should be out by the end of this year. So we'll have the adapted curriculum. It'll be on, hopefully, on the app by the end of the year, just so you guys know, but it's exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question? Lots of balls, yeah. Yeah, we use, again, you know, foam balls, red balls, orange balls, green dots, all excellent. I wish I had those as a kid, you know, uh, instead of the full, full size rackets and uh, yellow ball. Uh, so, pushing a chair. Okay, we're going to get in and we're going to go through a little warm up with these guys. Um, we may spare them the warm up of the racket as far as the pushing is concerned. But pushing with a, a racket in your hand. Is, is a, I'm not gonna say it's a deterrent, but it is a challenge. And for us as coaches, when we go through stroke production, we'll explain the forehand grip is really the grip you wanna use for pushing. So for all of you guys here who have a racket, okay, you're gonna use close, as close to a semi-western as possible. There, we won't go into the nuances of how you grab the push rim, but that is the grip you're primarily gonna use. Unless you're, say, a quadriplegic player that has to take his racket or her racket in a particular position because of their disability. That's an adaptive piece that you're gonna to have to work with. A lot of the athletes who are quads, who tape, will have to choose a grip that works, and what they tend to do is tape, and then turn the tape over so the glue sides up. They don't have the ability maybe to grab the push rim like we do, so they use the glue side of the tape to get some tackiness so they can push with, say, the top of their arm. So those are some of the adaptations that you guys are going to have to go through, okay, depending upon the person. Okay, Josh, you do that too. So let's do this. We're going to go through a light warm up without rackets. So we can, act, why don't we put the rackets, you got to push now. Put I'll the take rackets you. up against the, oh. I'll take, I'm so nice. I know, I'm nice. Well, every once in a while. Okay, so no, what I want to do is get you guys across the sideline. You can be off of the baseline and the sideline as well. Come on. Get this hey, out of the way. Just let's kind of yeah. stagger it all the way down. You should be able to get everybody. You hey, see that, that chair sounds like it's going to break. Can you explain to them what they should be pushing with the rim of the tire? Yeah. 
because one of them is wrong. Yep. It's all part of it. Okay, so when you guys push, you know, you want to find, you know, the, the target spots in your hands that, that make the best contact. Some players like to use the push rims exclusively, right? They like to use the push rim because it's easy to grab. Some athletes that have larger hands, okay, they may, you know, maybe extend their thumb out and grab the tire itself just so they just get more surface area. Now, with the racket in your hand, that's a little bit more challenging. So you got to play with it a little bit. Personally, I like to have the racket up against the push rim. And maybe my thumb touches the tire a little bit, but my fingers, which are now wrapped around the grip in a forehand grip, grab the push rim on the underside. And we'll have you guys feel that in a moment. And that is how you push with the racket. Now, to just get started in the push, one thing you got to understand is, when I push the right wheel, I go left. Okay? When I pull on the right wheel, I go right. That's kind of hard mentally to get your head wrapped around. And then the left wheel. When I push the left wheel, I go right. When I pull, I go left. Those are things you've got to kind of spend time in the chair as a coach to really kind of grasp. We as able-bodied coaches playing in the chair, we can no longer move laterally without turning and moving laterally. We can't just take a step out. There is no open stance. Okay, and we can't we can't jump, right? So if a ball is going up, you got two options. You got to either charge it and catch it before it gets over you, or as you're tracking the ball, you have to turn and get back. And as it comes down, that is not something we deal with exclusively as able-bodied players. So that is a growing, uh, you know, that's something we all have to understand. Once you get in the chair, you understand it much better. And that's why it's important you guys are doing this. Let me maybe scoot down a little bit. You don't want to. Let's have you guys crunch down a little bit. Okay, so all I want you guys to do, have a little bit of space between you guys. You can actually slide out. So think about an adaptive. How do we have kids or adults warm up? Shuffling, light jog to the center line and back, those sort of things. You can easily adapt that with a chair. Okay, so here I am. I'll demonstrate quickly. All I want you guys to do is when I say go, this could be fun because I think it could have some, uh, you know, collisions happen. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to push with both hands evenly across the center line. Everybody's going to turn right. And then we're going to come back and stop. It's not a race, okay? But we're going to try and go as fast, not as fast, but as straight as we can, okay? Without ramming into each other, okay? But remember, if you turn left, you're going to run right into the person next to you, okay? So everyone go to the line, turn around, and come back. Right hand turn at the line. The chair should do it. No, no, not this far. Just center line and back. Now turn. Yep, and head back. That's it. Okay. So again, from a, from a warm-up standpoint, I could say do that five times. And then we'll extend it to the end line. Middle line back, end line back. Any of those drills that you guys do can be adapted. Okay. From a pushing perspective, this is important, probably should include you guys in. You know, when you get an athlete in a chair, a lot of people ask, well, how do you want them to sit? How high should they sit? How low should they sit? Those are, those are good questions to ask, but you, know, you need to know the disability. If I have a non-spinal cord injury who has full trunk, we really like to have them sit up as tall as possible. Okay? And they need as low a back rest as they can have. Because we want them, it's, we really lean towards an able body hit. The taller I sit, the better I'm going to hit. The only problem is, the further I get away from the wheels, the lesser the push. I can't get as deep a push. So you've got to find a balance to where someone's comfortable, have a balance point, but they can also get a really strong grab on the chair. Okay, and that's like getting a good, you know, getting out of the hole, uh, bending your knees, that's bending my elbows. Uh, and I typically have our athletes start at about 12 o'clock, okay? I don't want to get too deep, okay? Not so great for the shoulders. So I go 12 to about two. Notice that's full extension. That's about all I'm gonna get out of the push anyway, okay? It's gonna be, and, and again, out of the hole, say I'm, excuse me, return and serve, and I've got a little motion, and I wanna get out of that hole quick, it's gonna be a couple quick bursts. Then my pushes become more elongated. So if you watch me do this, I'll do two quick pushes, you know, 
bang, bang, and then I slowly lengthen it out. But notice I'm trying to get out of the hole quick. Okay, and these are just technical things as well as pushing. So what I want you guys to do is do two hard pushes and then kind of lengthen it out all the way to the end line and back, again with the right hand turn. Okay, with the right hand turn on your own. Go ahead. There we go. And then go back, and then go back. Okay, very good. Very good. These chairs are pretty responsive, right? So if you go too slow, you're gonna have one of these looks. You know, when you come up to make a turn and you're kind of like, <laughs> gotta make the turn back, okay? There are ways, again, using the non-dot, we'll get into that with strokes and balance that left hand. If I'm a righty, using my non-dominant hand is really important on this chair as I have my racket in my hand. The ability to maneuver this chair with my left is really, really important, but for breaking. So when I make that right hand turn, if I only push the right wheel, you're gonna look what I just looked on. But if you use your left, pull on your left and push with your right at the same time, which is a more advanced way to turn, look how much faster I can make this turn. Do it together at the same time and come back. That's much more athletic, much faster. The more time you spend in the chair, and it's the same thing going the other way. You could keep going in the same. That's correct. <laughs> It's a great question. Tim just asked, Does your, do your hands ever leave? Your right hand, or whatever, your playing hand, will be the hand that leaves the wheel to make the strike. But you know, some of the elite players who are, who are ambulatory, non-spinal cord injury, they will hit with their hand off of the wheel. They'll use their trunk for balance, right? The only deficit for them is they gotta get their hands down, right? Because after you hit, you can't just watch. You gotta go. Because we can hit as able-bodied people and, and continually move because our legs are underneath us. Here, I gotta get my hands back on the wheels. It's easily forgotten as, as new coaches of this. You forget to tell them, hey, get your hands back. That's important. Uh, so use your non-dominant hand for stability, to grab the chair, so when you hit, you're stable, but also for turning, okay? So to push, again, just to show you another adaptive drill, that we do, this is a basketball drill. This is gonna burn these guys up a little bit, but I'm sure they're gonna enjoy it, okay? So what we do is we just take the sideline. I mean, how many of you guys have your kids jumping back and forth, doing dynamic, you know, type exercises across the lines? Well, I can do that in a chair as well. So what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is I'm gonna have you start with your wheels behind the line, and you're gonna cross as fast as you can cross over the line and stop, and then pull back and stop, and go back and stop, and pull back and stop, and pull back, and pull forward, and back, and forward, and back. And you're gonna feel the skid in the chair, okay? And you're gonna go until I tell you to stop, okay? Where are you going? He's got that behind him. Oh, you can use that one, he's out of here. Okay. Are you guys ready? Go. Stop. Try and stay right on the other side of that line. Make sure you breathe. Good. Okay. Good. You can go faster, go faster. Good. Keep it short and sweet. Good. And stop. Okay. So again, how easy is that? Another adaptive one I'm going to show these guys. And this is where it gets fun. Is we're going to do a forward push to the center line quicker now, because we're now uh, very adept at this, and then we're gonna go backwards to here. So you're gonna look like this, and again, straight lines. No turn this time, no turn. So just straight ahead to this line, throw the brakes on, and then come straight back, as straight as you can. Okay? And then stop. Leaning forward, don't, look. no, that's it. It feels like in these things, that as soon as you lean back, you get a little bit of play, you really do feel like you're gonna go over. You're not gonna go over. That will not allow you to go over. Okay? You guys ready? Go! There we go. <laughs> Perfect. You know how to put your feet down. You're all that, right? Yeah, get your feet up. <laughs> uh, it's off the ground. 
you jump in this one? Yeah, you don't get that far. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, those are probably about the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got that one wheel on one side, you have to lean on it a little bit to make it work. That's much nicer, I know. It's a chair I use, it's a good one. And you can take that strap and zip it. Okay, the last drill we're going to do before we talk about specific mobility that's really attuned to hitting and, and the correct turns. This drill, again, another wonderful basketball drill, a gift by our in house Paralympian, Mackenzie Sullivan. He's going to go two hard pushes, stop, back one, stop. <laughs> this chair is awful. You get the idea. <laughs> so two forward, one back, two forward, one back, two forward, one back, so forth and so on, until you get to the end line. When you get to the end line, right hand turn, everybody right hand turn, sprint back. Okay? Two up, one back. Two up, one back. Go on your own. Whoa, stop quickly. Yep. One, make a short stop. Yep, quick stop. Yep. One back, one back, not two. That's it. And then come on back, sprint back. Oh, you, that's it. Hey, you guys, once you make the turn, all the way back. All the way back, come on, all the way back. You better stop. Come all the way back. Good. Good job, guys. Well, I may have to use that, you don't mind. Okay, good work. Thanks, Steven. That was fun. That's totally fun, huh? Let me tell you, kids, kids love these chairs. Whatever it is, the mechanics of the chair, they just, they grab kids' attention. And I think that's also another important aspect I've had. Oh, there we go. Maybe that was me, I'm not talking to Mike. Um, is when you get your, when you get able-bodied kids around the chairs, if you end up getting a program of chairs, let them play in them. Let them get as comfortable around it as possible. My program back in California, I was there. I had six chairs. I would bring them out all the time. And it would just allow the kids to play in it. And there was never that stigma of, oh, don't, don't touch the chair, don't go near the kids in the chairs, that sort of thing. It's that, that isn't conducive to, any, to being inclusive. Okay, we want to make the kids feel comfortable. Yeah, and it really is a wonderful way to help educate the kids. Yeah. Yes, we would. Yeah, we really would. We would actually try and put together play tennis in a wheelchair deck. You don't have to be disabled to play. A person with a disability to play in a chair. You can just play. And you get you get some of our you know our better guys, that four oh four five guys who are athletic and, and some of the ladies would get out and get around these things. And what it did was, fortunately at the club I was at, we were the host uh, to the Unico Wheelchair Doubles Masters, Doubles World Championship. So our club members were exposed to the elite level, especially doubles as Joe said watching uh, the men especially, simply because of the upper body strength, to watch them play intimately, as close as you guys are, it really changes everything. And I, if you guys are around for the second week of the Open, you absolutely have to come out and watch the wheelchair athletes. If you miss them on Ash, come to the outer courts and find them. It is totally worth your time. I promise you that. Especially you guys who've tried it now, changes your perspective a little bit. But trying the chair is totally different, okay? so. Let's do this. I want you guys to run through the next step. So we're going to go through what is universally known as the hub. The hub is the, really the primary mobility pattern drill that I want to share with you guys today. Uh, we're going to teach you three turns. Something called turning in, or an inside turn, an outside turn, and reverse mobility. These three things are critical for you to have some concept of when you start a program. Because if you have that going in, when I started, I didn't know anything. And so I had to learn on the fly. You can do that. Okay, but man, there's so much has been done. You don't need to struggle like that. We have so much information to help you guys that this stuff will be very helpful to teach your athletes how to turn correctly. It's like having good footwork. It's the same thing. Okay? So if you guys don't mind coming behind me. Go back that way. Okay? <clears throat> So you guys, I don't know if you can see it or not, but we put some of the discs down to mark particular spots on the court. We typically will put them maybe a foot or two 
uh, inside the service line towards the baseline and a foot inside on both sides. Again, the same here, just inside the baseline. Maybe one of the team, okay? And this one here is your hub. This is your home base. Now, as we play, this hub moves. Depends upon where you recover. But for practice, to teach you guys the correct turns, this is very easy to set up. And I would personally start with some of the drills we just did with these guys, but I would make sure my athletes do this every day that they're at the courts, okay? So the first turn, and imagine I'm a right-handed player. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make what we call an inside turn, basically off of a forehand. If you notice the line I'm gonna take, it's pretty close to a 45 degree angle. That is important. I do not wanna get too flat in going for a ball where I'm hitting across my chest. There, I'm sorry, pushing the other You know, where I'm hitting across my chest. Almost like an open stance or semi-open, this is what I want. This is an easy place to make contact, okay? So my approach for a forehand, again, say 45 degrees, I'm tracking the ball coming in, I prepare with my racket, I swing, I come around, get my hands down, and I recover back to the hub, always looking over my inside shoulder. And I do that because I wanna see what my opponent's response is gonna be. I simply don't wanna put my head down, a lot of people do this, they make their hit, they put their head down, and then they look. By that time, the ball has been struck. Seems remedial, but it's easily forgotten. Okay? Another aspect, and it goes back to the question I had was, are your hands always on the wheels? That non-dominant hand is on that wheel a lot, maybe 90% of the time. So when I wanna make this turn a little bit cleaner, what do I do? I pull on my left wheel. And so here I come, right arms in the air, but I turn using my left, using this, okay? And so that's important that we, again, don't swing too wide because, again, I make a play, I hit, and I'm making a wide turn. The ball's gonna be by me before I can even recover, if that makes sense. And another problem with the chair, and all you guys can feel how athletic these are, is if I make my turn too tight, and I come around this way. I lose momentum and then I gotta get on a hard push. That would be a mistake. The turn's correct, but it's not executed correctly. Right? So that is an inside turn, an offensive turn. Because I'm using, again, my forehand side. On the back end, this would be a turning out. So I would have, again, racket in hand. Here comes the ball to this corner. I would push out, left hand on the wheel, make a hit. Turn around, and again, look over my inside shoulder. Hands back down in the wheels again. Might be easier. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so inside and outside turn, pretty straightforward. So if you watch me do it with a racket, I push, I prepare, I strike, I look up court, and my, I'm, again, I'm looking. Oh, they go to my back hand. Same deal. Hit my back hand. Turn around, look up court. Again, recovering at a 45 degree angle. Okay, very different than what you guys teach your able body kids. Very different, okay? So that's your inside and your outside. And the one turn that everyone asks about, well, what if they go behind you? You know, what if, if I hit that forehand and I'm recovering and they go back to my forehand side? The common mistake all of you as coaches will make is you'll turn in. Okay, you'll do this. They'll hit behind you, and you'll want to do that. By that time, the ball has already gone by, okay? So the correct term, well again, calling it reverse mobility, is here, you make your hit, I recover, and then I go this way. And notice when I recover, if the ball's a little bit short and behind me, I might be able to turn back and still get somewhat of an offensive shot. But most of the time, you're gonna see me do this, come out here, get a forehand, recover, turn out and head backwards to hit a defensive shot. To do what? To buy myself time. And then from there, where would I go? This way and recover back to the hub. Right, does that make sense? I mean, that's, that, that's your whole life. You do not do this in wheelchair tennis. You don't do that. That is death. You, you are going to lose the point 
exponentially quicker doing that. The only time pulling out of the way is acceptable is if a ball is hit right at me, I would again take my left hand and do what? Turn the chair to create space. That's it, okay? Is that, hopefully that makes sense. As opposed to doing this, and it does happen, I pull, I've got room, and I can make a play, or I can dig it out with a slice. Does that make sense? But again, that's left hand. It's all left hand. So non-dominant hand's a big deal. So again, inside turn, outside turn, reverse mobility, 45 degree line, okay? Any touch stroke production, looking up court, okay? And then again, preparing to maybe have to turn back if they go behind me. That's your whole life, okay? At a grassroots level, that's it. That's, it's a lot, it's a lot. So now that leads me to back to the discs again. We call, hey everybody, we're gonna do the hub drill tonight. And everybody moans and goes, oh my God. But again, you can do it slow, you can do it fast. You guys don't need rackets. And actually, I won't even demo with a racket. It's okay. You can envision I'm swinging. Watch how I do this. Very simple. So I go around. I can simulate a swing. Look up court. Maybe I turn. Oh, short ball. Go forward for a short ball. Go around. Again, looking back up court if I can. Again, there might be an adaptation there. If you have a quadriplegic player who doesn't have the ability to rotate their neck, they may, have to, they may need to go a little flatter because they can't turn their head. That's just the nature of the disability. So maybe doing this and recovering the steep, they can't, they can't see, they may have to recover this way. They just might have to adapt and then turn back if they have to. Okay, so you can see the progression. So I go from the short ball to here, maybe I, I go then go track down a drop shot, make a play here, turn around again, trying to look over my shoulder, go around the hub again, Oh, short backhand, same deal, I'm up here, make a play, look over my inside shoulder, recover back, maybe go around, turn back out, and finish, just making the cycle. You can do it, thank you. Thank you. None, that's an excellent point. So why do you do the forward and Just for strength, grabbing, feel, stability, all that, more training, it's a good question. But again, notice, it's a good point. Am I headed backwards when I do this? A lot of people say yes. Oh yeah, you're going away from the court. Yes, you are kind of heading away from the court, but I'm going forward, right? That's important, I'm always going forward. I'm not pulling back. Yeah, that's a good point. The only time you would say it's okay to pull back, and I know this is like, this doesn't happen. You just, how often do you see, see someone on the court in a power chair? A power chair is very different. We're not gonna get into the weeds on that. The power chairs have the use of a joystick where they're just going to put on the brakes and pull back, stop, and then push the joystick forward again, right? They're not going to have the time in the power chair to go all the way around. It's just a different chair. These chairs are so athletic, okay? So what I'm going to ask these guys to do one at a time. <laughs> yes. You're wearing red. Yeah, so you shouldn't have wore red today. Okay? So on your own, you're just going, always coming back to the yellow disc. Let's just see how you do. Make sure you breathe. Don't hold your breath. Hold your breath. Go back. Look over your inside shoulder. That's it. Wow, look at these guys. Natural pushers. Excellent. I look over and I gotta figure out how to look back up court. That's it. That's all right. Now back to the yellow. Yeah, ball very passive. Ball's gone. Excellent, very good. Okay, one more. Maybe a back there. Good. Good job. Excellent. All right, next, next, next. Here you go. Here we go. Let's keep this rolling. Okay. No pressure. Is my mic on? Yeah. Three minutes and then. You gonna put a racket in that hand? No. <laughs> no rackets in the hand. No rackets. Hey, just so you guys know too, as you're playing and watching, I've said this many times, the wheelchair athletes play the most amazing shots out of position that no able body would play. We had Francis TFO out one day on campus. It was the funniest thing we've ever seen. 
Um, it will haunt him for the rest of his life. But I've never seen Francis think that he can play a ball like this. But every ball was like that. If you watch the players, the balls that they are playing and the way they hit is just the most amazing shot making ever. Because you wouldn't ever see anyone. You know, the way that they're moving and pulling off and having to play balls this way and having to, having to actually hit overheads or hitting balls this way to get them back in is truly amazing. Okay. Yes, I know we're running out of time, quickly. It's amazing how that happens. Real quick, from a stroke production, the adaptations, very little. Okay, the one Joe mentioned earlier, inverted back in. Essentially a semi-western forehand. To the other side, you do not change your grip. That is your opportunity to hit topspin. You can use an Easter. Okay, it depends on your disability. For athletes that have a lot of trunk, a lot of balance and set up, a stock Eastern backhand is fine. But a lot of the athletes use that inverted. Okay, and from a serving standpoint, I know I'm blowing through this quick, but again, a lot of athletes, if I have an athlete with a spinal cord injury, balance, when they toss the ball, they're gonna probably wanna grab the wheel for stability when they hit. Does that make sense? If I've got an amputee who's got trunk, you're gonna maybe do a stock, traditional serve. But if I'm in spinal cord injury, I'm gonna grab when I hit. Some of the athletes even pull back, rotating into the ball. And that's the last thing about this. Remember, this is simulating your hips. So when I hit a forehand and I rotate the chair, that's my hips rotating into the ball. That's the adaptation, okay? And that's, that doesn't do it justice, but hopefully, you guys got something out of that. It's a lot of information, a lot of history, uh, but we do hope you guys are good. Thank you. Hand, round of applause for these guys. Any questions? Anything from anybody? Yes, sir. Yes. Are you asking to run a tournament? Both. So you asked about me. Yes. Hey guys. Are you guys think you can bring the chairs over here? That's fine. So you run the court. five courts. Just wheel them back yes. over here. Yes. Yeah. Questions Thank about running guys. a club. Yes. Hope you enjoy that. It's, it's fun. Say that again? Yes. That's a great question when it'll be ready. Hopefully by the end of this year and you'll access it through the Net Generation app. It'll just be on there as a wheelchair adaptation. We'll put more stuff out too on our USTA wheelchair page. We'll have everything out there. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very Thanks, much. Jason. Thank Good you job. so much. Thank you.